It is relatively easy to see why this appraisal never took place. In the first place, Fuchida's status as a premier carrier aviator bolstered his credibility from the first. Even during his initial interviews in 1946 for the United States Strategic Bombing Survey, which are an important touchpoint for any work dealing with Pacific War history, his American interrogators noted that Fuchida answered questions frankly and carefully. He was considered one of the most lucrative sources of information and a reliable witness. There were many things to recommend Fuchida to a Western audience. He was charming, intelligent and articulate. He also gained authority thanks to a gift for self-promotion. He subsequently became great friends with Gordon Prang, author of The Phenomenally Successful Miracle at Midway, and it is likely that this friendship precluded Pranger's questioning Fuchida too closely. Not only that, but few Westerners in the 1960s and 1970s were in any position to critique Japanese carrier operations. Perhaps the only individuals capable of doing so were the United States naval officers, charged with preparing the United States Strategic Bombing Survey and Air Technical Intelligence Group reports immediately after the war, particularly the latter, since they were tasked with probing Japanese carrier operational technique. Yet their knowledge was apparently not applied to the study of any specific battle, and since that time the Air Technical Intelligence Group accounts have lain largely forgotten by historians. Japan was similarly devoid of critics, at least initially. When Fuchida and Okumiya's book was first published in 1951, Japan was emerging from the initial phase of United States occupation, which was accompanied by strict censorship. The Japanese military had been utterly disgraced. Former officers were in no hurry to talk about their wartime experiences. When the first censorship bans were lifted, however, Fuchida moved quickly to get his version of the story out. Roger Pino, a former United States intelligence officer during the war, seized on Fuchida's manuscript in 1953 as a tremendous addition to the Western literature. Midway was rightly seen as the critical battle in the Pacific, and there was no question that a man of Fuchida's stature would have an important viewpoint on it. As one of Japan's foremost carrier aviators, the man who had led the attack on Pearl Harbor, and as Carrier Division 1's air group commander, Fuchida clearly had access to information from Nagumo's inner circle. In the absence of a detailed account from gender at this time, and the deaths of Yamamoto, Nagumo and Yamaguchi during the war, Fuchida, along with Admiral Kusaka, was one of only a handful of senior officers likely to be privy to the command decisions of the day. He would certainly seem to be the ideal chronicler of the attack on Kido Butai on 4 June. Along with the United States Strategic Bombing Survey interviews and the Nagumo report, Fuchida's book became one of the three cornerstones of the Japanese-English account on the battle and it was woven deeply into the major Western histories. Unfortunately, it is clear in retrospect that Fuchida was not a faithful narrator. Indeed, our own work spends much of its time correcting the errors Fuchida introduced into the record. Given all this, one is left to ponder two things. First, was Fuchida merely a poor observer, or did he willingly alter the historic record? And if he did, why did he fabricate such a tale? The first point is relatively easy to answer. Fuchida Mitsuo did not tell the truth. Unquestionably, it is harsh to use the blunt word lie to characterise the statements of an eyewitness, but his distortions of the events are so numerous and so critical to the overall understanding of what happened that the term is completely justified. For example, Fuchida claimed Nagumo lacked critical information on the eve of the battle, when, as was shown in Chapter 6, Kido Butai's communication procedures were clearly giving Nagumo timely access to intelligence data, and also informed him of the failure of Operation K to reconnoitre Pearl Harbour. In the same vein, Fuchida faulted gender for not using a two-phase aerial search plan, even though such doctrine was not introduced until 1943. These incorrect details, in turn, alter the calculation of where blame should lie for any errors committed. Some of Fuchida's misstatements deal with seemingly minor things, like how quickly and easily the Japanese could land their air groups on carriers. Yet it becomes apparent that such details, in turn, can cause a critical misevaluation of the timing of aircraft operations. And of course, 
His most blatant untruth concerned the state of the Japanese flight decks immediately before the decisive American attack at 10.20 a.m. to 10.27 a.m. on 4 June. This last point is not trivial, as Fuchida's deliberate distortion of the details surrounding this crucial event led to the rapid obscuring of contrary evidence. Evidence such as post-war interviews with other Japanese officers, who plainly stated that armed and fueled aircraft were in the hangars when Akagi, Kaga and Soryu were struck, not on deck. Furthermore, recent scholarship has shown that Fuchida lied not only about the Battle of Midway, but also about Nagumo's apparent unwillingness to launch a follow-up strike at Pearl Harbor. Fuchida must be judged as any other participant in battle would be. An occasional error in observation is forgivable but Fuchida's account reveals a pattern of distortions and outright falsehoods that alter the picture of the battle in critical ways. They also have the effect of making Fuchida look better at the expense of his colleagues. These aren't accidents. They are the marks of a man with an agenda. There are several good reasons for his behaviour. The first pertains to combined fleet and first air fleet staff immediately after Midway. Despite Admiral Yamamoto's statement that he alone was to blame for the catastrophe, it seems unavoidable that Admiral Nagumo and his staff would have had some explaining to do upon their return. Fuchida, though not directly in the chain of command, would certainly have been part of the group under scrutiny, along with Admiral Kusaka and Commander Genda. The mental anguish can only be imagined that these individuals must have experienced as the main body made its way back to Japan after the devastating defeat. As Paul Dull noted in his study of the Japanese Navy, the phrase ko narimashita, it happened this way, is more socially acceptable to the Japanese than ko shimashita, I or some other man or men did it this way. To say otherwise is to offend the Japanese sensibility and its sense of history. Taken in this light, an explanation to Naval General Headquarters by Kido Butai's officers that went roughly along the lines of we were within minutes of launching the strike that would destroy the enemy, but then the fates of war intervened was probably a fairly palatable tale. Whether this rendition of events was concocted as a group, devised by Fuchida alone, or was simply the result of some unspoken understanding between Nagumo and his senior officers is impossible to know. Whatever the case, it apparently played well enough at Naval General Headquarters that it served its purposes, the fates of war account for want of a better name matched the generally known facts closely enough that no one at Naval General Headquarters was going to know anything different, at least in the short term. Not only that, but it was certainly much more agreeable than the unalloyed truth of the matter, which was, because of the Navy's, Admiral Nagano's and Naval General Headquarters, utter inability to conceive of a way to bring the war to closure. Thus, a badly flawed operational scheme was created by the Chief of Combined Fleet Admiral Yamamoto that attempted to be a substitute for truly strategic level thinking. As a result of this plan, the commander on the scene, Admiral Nagumo, was inevitably placed in a position where he and his men, Admiral Yamaguchi, Kusaka and Genda, committed irretrievable operational blunders. This, in conjunction with an ill-conceived response to the sudden appearance of American forces, resulted in the needless loss of irreplaceable national assets. Indictments of the entire upper echelon of the Navy were evidently not welcome at this point in the war. Indeed, throughout the war the Japanese Navy and Army as well demonstrated a remarkable inability to ask tough questions and learn from its mistakes. This tendency was further reinforced by the strong sense of in-group loyalty displayed by members of the Navy's officer corps toward one another. In the face of unwelcome circumstances, this loyalty often took on the form of a code of silence among the ranks of Etajima graduates. It is not surprising, therefore, that a fates of war explanation was generally acceptable within the Navy. This organisational failing becomes more understandable when placed within the context of Japan's gothically dysfunctional wartime leadership. It must be recalled that even in the best of times, the Navy's relationship with the Imperial Army was strained. The Navy regarded those in the army as uneducated bumpkins, whose understanding of strategy and international relations was abysmally plebeian. The army, for its part, regarded those in the Navy as arrogant elitists who had been lavished with a grossly disproportionate share of the nation's resources. Both parties were largely correct in their mutual assessments, 
By the time of Midway, far from having been improved by Japan's string of victories, relations between the two services had retreated into icy formality. Indeed, it has been recounted elsewhere that when Japan's Prime Minister, General Tojo Hideki, finally learned of the calamity at Midway, far from being horrified at what the defeat portended for the nation's ability to prosecute the war, his initial reaction was one of waspish self-satisfaction that the Navy had been defeated in an action that the Army had opposed. Operating on such a twisted political landscape, where rational decision-making was nearly absent from the scene, it is perhaps not surprising that the Navy's overriding goal was rallying itself internally and presenting a united front to the Imperial Army, rather than learning the hard lessons the battle had to offer. Under such pressures, it is all too easy to imagine a story being arrived at that played to institutionally and culturally acceptable themes, while deliberately playing down the fact that Kido Butai was unprepared to launch a counter-strike at 10.20am. After the battle, Fuchida was part of a Battle Lessons Research Committee, chartered with compiling information and presenting strategic and tactical lessons learned from the Midway engagement. Fuchida claims that six copies of the final report of the committee were produced, all of which were lost in the general destruction of records that occurred after the war. Fuchida, however, apparently rediscovered a draft manuscript of the report in his footlocker after the armistice, and those notes formed the basis of his account. It's likely that what he had was a surviving copy of the Nagumo report, or some work derived from it, since a careful analysis of Fuchida's book reveals almost no factual details or maps not found in the Nagumo report itself, where he introduces distortions and sensationalism in the narrative accounts of events like the 10.20 a.m. attack, the circumstances under which Fuchida produced his book in 1951 also help account for its distortions. He was writing for the Japanese lay public at a time when the civilian mood in Japan was rightly extremely critical of the military's performance during the war. Former military officers were not held in high esteem. In this context, it seems clear that Fuchida had an agenda, namely re-establishing the reputation of the navy and portraying Kido Butai in the most favourable light. Fuchida was well within his rights for wanting to paint a positive picture of the crack military unit he had served with, as Kido Butai was legitimately the finest carrier force in the world at the outbreak of the Pacific War and had performed brilliantly up until Midway. His method of doing so, however, continued the military's tradition of not facing up to ugly truths, as well as preserving a code of silence around embarrassing matters. In a sense, Fuchida's book is a final testimony to the less-than-honest thinking that prevailed in the Navy during the war. Fuchida went about his task shrewdly, creating an account that paid lip service to Japanese mistakes, while hiding key operational details. He also benefited from a sort of first-mover advantage by being the first account published. In effect, he dared people to call him a liar. None were willing to do so while he was alive. Fuchida also took the opportunity to direct clever criticism on his colleagues, while painting himself as having been more knowledgeable at the time of the battle than he actually was. The overall picture that emerges is of a man who wanted to be recognised as the authority on the battle, while still carefully distancing himself from any personal responsibility for the disaster. These strategies were relatively successful in 1953. Fuchida's intended audience was not terribly sophisticated in military affairs, nor was it likely to probe the underlying details of his account. Japan's official war histories had yet to be written, and there was a dearth of solid material to either confirm or deny his version of events. Most Japanese naval officers weren't talking about the war, and a trend which regrettably resulted in the vast majority of these men taking their accounts to the grave. Fuchida's story was a good one, and it played well to his intended audience. After all, Japan had just suffered an enormous national humiliation, one particularly devastating to a society that viewed itself as uniquely superior. Japan's defeat could not be denied, but some sense of national pride might be regained by revealing some moments of nobility within that defeat. Thus, if he took a few liberties with his interpretation of events, he probably was not outside the bounds of accepted artistic licence, and he wasn't likely to be questioned closely about operational facts in any case. The same was true in the West, indeed, 
the very fact that Fuchida's account fit nicely with the prevailing American mythos surrounding the battle probably shielded it from closer scrutiny. Fuchida's rendition of the American dive bombers hurtling downward at the last second to win the day is very much in keeping with the American view of the battle, wherein the good guys, through courage, fortitude and not a little luck, snatch victory from the very jaws of defeat. As such, Fuchida's story nicely bolstered the broader tenor of the winner's rendition of events, but it also still managed to acquit the Japanese force with some degree of honour. All in all, his account was good stuff, tailor-made for a blockbuster Hollywood movie. With such an account in place, there seemed little need to develop additional Japanese sources. As a result, the Western record regarding the Japanese side of the battle remained essentially unchanged for almost half a century. The fact that Japanese carrier operations were so poorly understood in the West didn't help matters any. It was only with the publication of books by authors such as David Evans, Mark Peaty and John Lundstrom that the technical and doctrinal details concerning the Imperial Navy's carriers began coming to light. Those records that had existed in English before the publication of these works were primarily technical in nature and had not been placed within the larger context of the Imperial Navy's development and doctrine. As a result, up until the 1990s, Western scholars, at least those who could not or would not consult the Japanese sources, were in no position to be able to analyse Japanese accounts with any accuracy. In Japan, however, things had moved ahead. The publication of the official Japanese war histories Senshi Sosho in the late 1970s inevitably called Fuchida's version of events into question. The midway volume of Senshi Sosho left no doubt that Nagumo's counter-strike was far from being ready when the fatal American dive bomber attack occurred. This directly called into question the fateful five minutes rendition that Fuchida had put forth, and in the eyes of most knowledgeable observers in Japan, he was discredited. Apparently, however, no one bothered telling the Americans this, this fact was brought home to the authors in 2000. The authors' suspicions about Fuchida's account were already taking form by then, because certain points in his book did not mesh with accepted descriptions of Japanese carrier deck operations. There were also discrepancies between his account and some of those found in the strategic bombing survey interviews. However, it was a conversation between the authors and John Lundstrom that crystallised the matter. Lundstrom had noticed in one of those rare epiphanies when the obvious suddenly reveals itself that the photographs taken by American B-17s over Kido Butai on 4 June showed completely empty flight decks on three of the Japanese carriers at around 8am. What did that mean? To be sure, the pictures were taken more than two hours before the American attack, but it caused Lundstrom to pose an interesting question. Had Nagumo's reserve strike force ever been on the deck at any time during the battle? That question, in turn, catalyzed the author's efforts to develop a model that described carrier operations such as deck spotting and rearming. This, in conjunction with the surviving Japanese carrier action reports from the battle that detailed the launching and recovery of combat air patrol fighters, began raising serious doubts about the accuracy of Fuchida's rendition of the 10.20 a.m. attack, in an effort to ascertain the validity of this approach, separate inquiries were sent to two knowledgeable Japanese sources, politely asking for their insights on the matter. This was done in an extremely circumspect fashion, on the assumption that Fuchida was still held in high regard in Japan, and not wanting, as foreigners, to appear disrespectful toward a famous war hero. Given how cautiously those inquiries were posed, the responses that came back were startlingly blunt in their outright dismissal of Fuchida and were later echoed by other Japanese sources as well. One summarised the matter flavourfully. To tell why Fuchida's book contains transparent lies, it's necessary to explain the background of the time it was written. Until around Showa 27, 1952, Japan's speech and writing was under censorship, so they could not say what they wanted. However, since around Showa 28, 1953, cheering up memoirs by mainly former military personnel were rushed out. Of course, the mental pressure of those who were truly incompetent and responsible, and who tried to conceal their own faults, gave strong effect as well. Fuchida's Midway, or Kusaka's Kido Butai that came out almost simultaneously, 
could be regarded as nonsense books which were meant to conceal failures and incompetencies of such kind and to protect each other. If they are still among the few books available on the Battle of Midway that have been translated into English, it's a funny story. Very funny indeed, as well as a cutting indictment of Western scholarship, Fuchida's rendition of events had, in effect, distorted the West's study of the battle for fifty years. True, the language barrier had played a major part in this failure to access newer Japanese sources, but it must also be admitted that American complacency contributed to this scholarly lethargy. Indeed, this lethargy was such that crucial details from other sources were ignored, apparently as being unreliable, because of Fuchida's greater standing in American historical circles. Fuchida may not have been telling the truth, but Western scholars had only themselves to blame for having failed to access the contemporary sources that were available in Japan and that had lain untouched for decades. It is to be hoped that the common wisdom surrounding the Battle of Midway can now return to a more elastic state, wherein scholars can make new contributions to our understanding without being held hostage by a single account. It will be increasingly impossible for one survivor's account to have the same effect on the study of Midway in any case, as the veterans who fought the battle are, sadly, declining rapidly in number. Indeed, the real decision-makers at Midway, Yamamoto, Nagumo, Genda, Kusaka, Yamaguchi, have all been dead for years. From now on, like it or not, the study of this enormously important battle will necessarily be based less on survivor accounts and more on the interpretation of operational data. The increasing importance of such data was one reason this study placed considerable emphasis on technology and doctrine. It turned out that the placement of airplanes in a carrier hangar, the mounting systems that secured bombs and torpedoes to those planes, and the speed of elevator movements yielded important information on how strikes were prepared. Similarly, the doctrine of launching massed airstrikes produced important benefits in some situations and caused fatal delays in others. Hopefully, our approach likewise has yielded important new perspectives and is not simply a convenient angle that rehashes well-known facts in an effort to make them appear fresh. Similarly, the discrediting of many of the commonly held beliefs concerning the battle was the inevitable result of a careful re-examination of the previous accounts and a determined effort to probe new information that has become available. Our object was not to pick a fight with existing opinions in the hope of creating controversy. Rather, it was done in hopes of establishing a firmer foundation for future studies of the battle, a foundation robust enough not to be held hostage by any one account or source. By adding newer tools into the mix, computer-aided reconstructions, marine forensics and naval architecture among others, this study seeks a broader, more fully integrated approach than prior histories of the battle. Without question, elements of this account will be modified and reinterpreted in the future, perhaps drastically. This process will doubtless accelerate as optical scanning and computer-aided translation technologies begin eradicating the language barriers that have plagued the study of the Pacific War. Such revisions are only to be expected. Indeed, they are to be welcomed. It is only by constantly endeavouring to dig more deeply that a closer approximation of the truth can be achieved. The Battle of Midway and the legacy of the brave men of both countries who fought and died there deserves no less.